Good afternoon and welcome to the October 15th regular meeting of the Parks, Recreation and Community Services Commission. May I have the roll call please? Commissioner Scarpetian? Here. Khan? Here. Rob Fogel is absent. Sharkey is absent. President Patrick? Here. The agenda for the October 15, 2012 meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall on Wednesday, October 10, 2012. Item 2, upcoming City Council agenda items. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon, President Patrick, members of the Commission. My name is Teresa Alexani, I'm Executive Analyst for Community Services and Parks. Just wanted to report we have two upcoming agenda items on the Council. Uh, the first one's on the Council agenda, which is for October 16th. It's a consent item, request for proposal for a proposed operations plan for the use of Cedar House at Glendale Heritage Garden to provide youth and family services. It's a council resolution to approve to go out for um, uh, basically request for proposals to provide youth, youth and family services at Glendale Heritage Garden. The youth and family services uh, program was consolidated, consolidated at Pacific Community Center through the last budget cycle. And so um, the, the Cedar House is now available and we're looking to bring a nonprofit that will be able to provide uh, similar services to the community. The second item we have is a joint um, successor agency and city council item, and it's for uh, both council and successor agency resolution to adopt plans and specs for the construction of 216 South Brand Boulevard and direct the city clerk to advertise for bids. It's for the Paseo project. Okay. And uh, there's also a council motion to approve minimum pedestrian passageway improvement plan located at 222 South Brand Boulevard and a successor agency motion to approve change order for Shimoda design and the amount of 75400 This is a joint, um, joint item with the economic development, and I believe they're the lead on it, but um, we're, we're also doing, uh, managing the project. So. Okay. Those are the only two items we have coming up. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. What is next? Item three, introductions and presentation, presentations at AA's presentation regarding the STAR program. Good afternoon, President Patrick, commissioners and department staff. My name is Norma Valles, Community Services Coordinator at Pacific Community Center. I'm here to present the STAR Youth Program. The STAR Program is a leadership long-term mentoring program for at-risk youth ages 9 through 14. The program began in 1995. It's been around for a while. STAR is directed by the Glendale Police Department in partnership with the Community Services and Parks Department. STAR stands for Students Training as Role Models. STAR meets every Tuesday from 3 to 6.30 p.m. at Pacific Community Center. Uh, let's see, I'm sorry. Uh, every Tuesday we assist with homework help, exercise or outdoor play, a warm meal for dinner, and a life skills lesson. Glendale police officers provide structured lessons relating to decision making, critical thinking, and physical fitness. Through the mentoring they receive each week and one day long outing each month, our students learn how to trust law enforcement and each other. The STAR program currently has 19 students enrolled. We are growing to 25 by the end of the school year. The program currently serves Edison Elementary School and Roosevelt Middle School. We have 10 elementary school students and nine middle school students enrolled in the program. The program targets kids needing direction. STAR gives kids the attitudes and abilities to make positive choices, set meaningful goals, succeed in school, and develop into leaders in the community. Teachers in the Glendale Unified School District and community leaders can refer participants to the program. The STAR, programs helps, the STAR program helps elementary school and middle school students focus on a positive future through academic achievement, life skills, and community services. This program also redirects youth with positive interaction by uniform officers and volunteers. By graduation, each student has developed the tools to be an effective advocate for the community and their own success. 
Services provided by the STAR program include academic tutoring, life skills classes regarding drug abuse and drug prevention, and gang prevention, sorry, uh, to prevent bullying, to increase self-esteem, and in dealing with peer pressure. The program incorporates games, skits, trivia, contests, and crafts to stress program goals. The STAR students also participate in service opportunities in the community, such as visiting the local convalescent centers and also participating in the neighborhood cleanup around Pacific Community Center and the annual Great American Cleanup in May every year. The STAR program creates opportunities for youth to explore alternatives to gangs and drug use and equip them for a life of success in the Glendale community. Every June, the program graduates to students entering high school. The former STAR students are encouraged to come back and volunteer in city programs. The students move on to show their leadership skills in high school and beyond. Many choose to participate in sports and academic clubs. We had one of our um, football players from Hoover that was highlighted in a newspaper, and he was a former STAR student, so we're really proud to have him there. Uh, the funding is uh, supported by the Community Development Block Grant Program and generous monetary and in-kind in donations from the community. We also would like to take a minute to thank our local businesses for their uh, support over the years. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Glendale Board of Realtors, the Police Department Volunteers, uh, various restaurants that help donate um, to our weekly meals uh, that the kids either um, help participate in making or uh, they donate the meal and completely cooked and ready to eat. Uh, California Pizza Kitchen, Panda Express, Dinah's, Trader Joe's, Domino's Pizza, Whole Foods, Honey Baked Ham, and Olive Garden. And we also get a lot of support from the fundraising from the police department volunteers. And if you know of anyone who would like to help, either by volunteering in the program or by donating a product or a monetary donation, uh, they can call 818-937-7244, or they can email us at star at ci.glendale.ca.us. Thank you for your support. It's a wonderful program, and we're we're glad to see this presentation about it. Do you, either of you have any questions or comments? You might have said it in your presentation. Um, how many kids do you have in your program, and what we, are the ages? We currently have nine students enrolled. We're looking to grow to 25 before the year is over. And the age range is from 9 to 14. 9 to 14. And the breakdown is 10 elementary school and 9 middle school <coughs> students at this time. Uh, the Great American Cleanup, that they, when, when is that? It's usually in mid-May. I'm not sure exactly what date it is for the upcoming year. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, what is next? Next we have item 3B, presentation of LEED Platinum Certificates for Pacific Park Pool. Good afternoon, President Patrick and Honorable Parks Commissioners. Um, well, uh, the purpose of my visit today is to acknowledge uh, a milestone in the Pacific Park Pool Project and to um, thank you for your support during this process. If you could, oh, uh, here we go. Um, the project was recently awarded LEED Platinum status, which you may or may not know is the highest um, level of certification that the Green Building Council awards for uh, sustainable construction projects. And um, as you can see here from, from the summary, um, the Green Building Council was founded in the early 90s by three folks. Um, its inception was uh, held at the uh, American Institute of Architects boardroom, and there were at the time there were 60 firms um, and nonprofits that were involved. And Nowadays, the uh, Green Building Council includes design professionals, city officials, students, teachers, uh, construction firms. And now, currently worldwide, there are 50,000 projects that are certified. Um, so it's grown quite a bit from its beginnings in 1993. 
and you can see, that, you know, they're, they're, it's currently grown a lot of chapters. There are 162,000 folks just in the United States that are certified uh, professionals. AP, um, they, they, it's a certification that they award for a, a um, sustainable development education. So it's something nice to add to your business card. <laughs> um, let's see. Now, again, I mentioned uh, Platinum. They're, they developed four levels of certification. And uh, when, when this first started, a lot of uh, projects were getting just a basic certification. Um, it, and it still is very difficult to get the Platinum certification, which is the, the highest possible. Um, in California, there are currently 1,623 LEED certified projects. And in the entire state, since 2000, when they started awarding certifications, there are only 164 platinum projects, and I'm pleased to say that the pool is one of only two platinum projects in the city of Glendale, the other being a private um, environmental firm. I think it's a branch office of a firm in Connecticut, so I think that's quite an accomplishment for our project and for the city. And you're, you're probably familiar with the, some of the aspects of the project. You were, you were there at the grand opening, but um, some of the environmental uh, and sustainability features are the solar panels you can see there that develop um, up to 45% of the, of the power needed for the site. Um, also the cool roof, you can see the, the white roof uh, on the, uh, in that photo on the right, and that uh, reduces the heat island effect. <laughs> And uh, also some of the other statistics down at the bottom, you know, where there was almost 30% of all the products on the project were recycled content. 60% um, of all of them came from within 500 miles of, of the project, which means that they're considered regionally um, manufactured project, um, products. And 50% uh, of all the wood used was certified wood product, products, which means that it didn't come from um, uh, old growth forests or that they were sustainably farmed um, uh, uh, lumbering practices where they replant and reharvest. Um, some of the other aspects were that the paints and adhesives were low vo uh, volatile off-gassing compounds. Um, that the, the entire irrigation system there is drip and it uses recycled water. The toilets are use recycled water as well. Uh, which uh, releases some demand for uh, drink, drinking water for other uses. Uh, let's see. Also, we re um, transplanted several existing trees, including some oak trees, um, that were in the playground area, of the tot lot. That was, you know, half of it was used for the pool project. Um, and uh, other things that we got points for were just being close to public transportation. We got points for kind of the nexus of being on a campus where there was a library, a health clinic, a school, and a community center all at once. So those are other points. And, and my favorite point, actually, is for environmental education. The, the tile mosaic on the pool deck depicts animals that are found at the nearby LA River. And uh, they lead from the entrance to the pool deck for, at the locker room to the, the shallow end where the children learn to swim. So we're, we're very proud of of all of these aspects of the pool. So that concludes it, um, my presentation. I don't know if you have any questions, otherwise I will, I'd like to hand you some uh, LEED Platinum Certificates in okay. thanks for your support. Would you, one of you like to go down and accept the Should. Bartan? Would or you I can, I, I'd be let, glad to walk them by. Oh. We do. Oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm very impressed and very pleased, and uh, what a wonderful! I mean, we know it's a wonderful project because we've we've heard about the pool and know how much it's it's used and needed. But then to also know that it's so environmentally efficient is really a fabulous thing. So congratulations to everyone that worked on it for for making it that kind of a project. There were a lot of a lot of people who contributed to it. Yes, the I'm sure there were. Well, thank you very much, and I'll just Well, thank you for coming and telling us about this. Thank you. Thanks.
again, thank you very much for coming and going through that with us today. Very proud. Okay, let's go on to the next item. Next we have item four, commission staff comments. Do we have any commission comments today? Do you have any? No, I have none today. I do not either. Do you have any? Well, I, uh, I participated at the event hosted by uh, Glendale Adventist Medical Center, uh, Army of Pink. They raise money for cancer survivors. It was a great event, and I encourage everyone to participate and help. Uh, my wife is one of the uh, uh, board members, and also we had four honorary people who were participating from uh, fire department, uh, police department, as well as our mayor is part of it, Mayor Frank Quintero. It was a great event, and I want to encourage everyone to participate if they could. Okay. I, actually, I guess I, I do have something. I'll just say that uh, the Kiwanis Club of Glendale did the, their annual duck race yes, or Saturday, and we had a fabulous turnout and made lots of money that we would be able to turn around and put back into the community in various programs. So thank you to all of you that participated in that. It was a fun day, and we did lots of good with that. So thank you. Are there any staff comments? Okay, then we'll move on to what's next. Next is five oral communications. I don't have any cards. Okay, I don't either, so we'll keep moving. Okay, item six, consent items. At 6A, we have approval of the minutes of the commission regular meeting held on August 20th, 2012. And uh, President Patrick, I was alerted to a mistake that was in the uh, minutes that were submitted to the commission originally. Uh, that has been corrected and new revised minutes have been submitted and a copy, a hard copy was placed on your, your desk. That was for under budget update. Have you had a chance to look at that change? Okay. So I would make a motion to approve the corrected minutes. Second. All right. Roll call. Commissioner Scarpetian? Yes. Khan? Yes. Rotful is absent. Sharkey's absent. President Patrick? Yes. Item 7, Business Agenda at A, Action Items at 1, Motion to Provide Feedback Regarding Temporary Public Art Display in Park Facilities and Recommend Approval of the Policy by the Arts and Culture Commission. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Commission, President of the Commission. Uh, my name is Annette Bartanian, and I'm the pro Program Supervisor in the Library Arts and Culture Department. I'm here today to give you a brief um, update on the Temporary Art Display and Community Services and Parks Facilities Policy. Um, that's a mouthful. Uh, and um, to get uh, your approval, uh, a motion approving recommendation to the Arts and Culture Commission. Essentially, this uh, policy was developed in response to artists' requests to display artwork in parks and parks facilities. As such, staff from Arts and Culture and Community Services and Parks developed this policy. Uh, the policy provides guidelines for submission, selection, exhibition, and insurance of the artwork. And I'll go briefly into each of these sections, and then if you have questions, we can answer them. So essentially, the submission guidelines um, lay out who can apply, the acceptable types of media, the proposal requirements. So we would um, you know, require a description of the proposed exhibition, an artist statement and resume, as well as images of the artwork. And then it also lays out the um, artwork guidelines. Essentially, we want artwork that's suitable for all ages since they are in public facilities. Um, the um, Art and Public Parks Committee will serve as the selection committee to evaluate the proposals. And it's uh, made up of a, um, a staff member from Community Services and Parks, Library Arts and Culture, and one Arts and Culture Commissioner. And the selection criteria um, that's listed in the policy will be used to evaluate the proposals. Um, it also lays out uh, requirements for the APPC uh, to uh, make a decision and notify um, all of the artists that have um, put in a, submitted a proposal, as well as an appeal process for any artists. Um, the exhibition guideline um, lays out the responsibility of the exhibitor, which is essentially they have to comply with the rules in the contract 
They have to display the artwork that was approved. They can't do a last minute change. And then they have to deliver and install the art and coordinate with the staff. Um, city staff's responsibility is to create signage identifying the artists and the artwork and to be able, available during the installation of artwork. Um, the policy prohibits the sale of artwork directly um, when it's being exhibited, but the signage that staff will prepare um, will um, um, basically will, we will relay any uh, requests um, directly to the artist. So after the exhibition is over, they can um, uh, choose to sell the artwork if they want. Uh, the policy also gives uh, the directors of both community services and park and libraries uh, the authority to remove or deinstall artwork or cancel a certain exhibit should it become necessary. Now we've identified six facilities that are available um, for the temporary installations and that's um, included on the um, as an exhibit. Um, it's Adams Square Mini Park Gas Station, the ARC, Brand Studios when the renovation is complete, Maple Park Community Center, Pacific Community Center, and Spar Heights Community Center. And finally, um, the uh, most important component is the insurance. Uh, we have to make sure that there is a public liability insurance coverage. Um, and we've listed two options um, for uh, obtaining that uh, insurance. Essentially, it's either the Arts and Culture Commission will pay for the necessary um, policy and the coverage through their budget, or that cost is passed down to the artist. Um, it can be anywhere between 5000 and 15000 on an annual basis. If it's passed on to the artist, it would be, depending on the number of artists, between 100 and $300. And the commission is going to review that as part of their, when they develop their work plan. Um, just to um, summarize, uh, essentially the program is going to be managed um, and implemented through library arts and culture. but. Uh, staff from uh, CSP will help coordinate the on-site installation since they are in parks facilities. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Teresa Alexanin, who also helped develop the pro um, actually she did the majority of it. I came in at the last minute and fine-tuned it. Uh, she's available to answer questions too. Okay. I know this, is, this has been a, a long process on a lot of work, so I think we do have some questions. questions. Commissioner Khan? Uh, a few questions for you. Sure. First of all, welcome. Thank you. Um, in terms of choosing the facilities, the six that you guys selected, and I'm thinking of things like the Civic Auditorium as well as being a one, and I'm not sure, and I know it's not under parks, but like City Hall. Um, did you guys, how'd you come up with the six, and are you looking to expand it, or did you really want to keep it just to those six facilities? I think this, we, um and Teresa, jump in if, um, if I'm going off in the wrong path. But I think this was originally designed just for parks to see how this policy would function. And should it be successful, then we were going to look at expanding it citywide. So right now it's just limited to parks facilities, and we're going to gauge the interest from the artists and to see how easily this could be implemented before we do a full-blown city program. It? No, I have some others, but go ahead. You can. Oh. <laughs> how many? How many spots do we have all together? How many spaces? It's a six. I, I was trying to count it, but there are six kind of spaces, um, but a couple. The well, there's six facilities, yes. and then in total, um, let's see. For example, ARC has four uh, walls available. Maple Park has three, so I can just count these if you want. Counting what? So would each of these go to a separate artist, or would there be a case where one artist might use all four walls in the Adult Recreation Center? Um, that's actually left up to the decision of the committee, but I think okay. the goal is to get as many artists involved as possible. Um, so if we have uh, more spaces than artists who um, submit, then the, the artists may have the opportunity to display in more than one facility, but we think that there's going to be a lot of interest in it, so we're going to have to limit uh, the number of artists to one space or one artwork. Okay. And, you know, right now you have, it's not, you have that gate, is it gate, where you put mm -hmm. art along, is it brand or wherever, and vacants. Who, who controls that? Is that a city controlled, or is that? 
That was uh, formerly funded through the redevelopment agency and a consultant was hired to coordinate the installation, the requests for proposals, securing the insurance and all of that. So it is a city program and it's managed by a, a private entity. But it's a separate program than what we're doing here? Yes, it's, it's separate. Okay. And then the timing of this, you said we may have a lot of interest. I, I noticed it was like six months to a year. Is that, how'd you come up with that time frame? Do you want to turn them over quicker or you figure, what was the time, how did no, you come up with that? It was essentially the, the time and the effort uh, something like this would take and um, essentially all the effort, we would do a request for uh, proposals or qualifications once every year and we anticipate having each installation be up between six months to a year. Just because the process to install and deinstall takes so much time, to be able to do this on a quarterly basis, a lot of staff would have to just dedicate their time solely to this. So we're looking to get the artist's maximum exposure, but also to give us some breathing room so that by the time we install something, we don't have to worry about taking it down. If I may, Madam President, uh, um, Commissioner Khan, you brought up two very uh, valid points. One was the expansion of the program to other f city facilities. So we have entertained the idea of not just a civic center, a civic building, well, the civic auditorium at City Hall, but, but also our public libraries and fire stations. I'm not sure where the police station falls into the conversation, but the fire stations definitely, where we have a lot of community meetings. Um, on the second question, given the time it takes to curate an installation per facility, because it's not going to be haphazard installations of different media and art forms. So potentially, we're going to be curating these uh, art pieces before they're installed in a given facility. So given the selection process, the request for artists, then the selection process and the installation process, we figure that it's best served if it's within a six-month uh, frame at least. Okay. Thank you. And. Uh I mean, uh, I'm looking at the cost, uh, mm -hmm. five to fifteen thousand dollars for insurance, and about three thousand dollars in the first year for uh, purchasing wall mounting and cable systems. If you want to transfer all these to the to the artists, between ten of them, it will be about five thousand dollars altogether. I mean, uh, twenty thousand dollars altogether. So it won't be five hundred dollars per person if they want to install their art. Uh, I mean, how, the how are we going to arrange that between? The, the, only, and the, the only thing that would be passed on would be the insurance. So the staffing and the wall mounting that would be covered through the Arts and Culture Commission's budget, okay. and that five to fifteen thousand is just essentially the number of artists we get. So if we get, uh, you know, a hundred artists then you know, it would be closer to 15000 And depending on the value of the artwork, we've put a cap at $5,000. So um, the, the fewer artists we have, the less the cost for the insurance is, and so the, the cost to them would be far less. But if you have 10, 10 spots, so each spot may accommodate more than one artist? Is that, is that how it's going to work? Okay. Potentially, yes. Right, mm -hmm. okay. So because if you have 100, 100 artists and 10, 10, 10, 10 spaces, then the math doesn't work. I mean, it's just. I mean, I, I said 100, depending on the size of the artwork, because some of these spaces okay. are very small. So, you know, you might have a, a group of artists that are able to do, you know, much smaller, um, you know, postcard size artwork, and we could accommodate, you know, 20 um, artworks in that it. one space. So that's what we were thinking. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just to add, add to that, Commissioner um, Garpedian, it's also like, for example, Michael Sheehan did an installation at the Adams Square gas station, and the insurance for that was about $300. So if it's the individual artist buying the insurance for their artwork, it would be a lot less. This is just an estimate and, and a span for what it could cost the city if we were to insure all of our facilities versus us buying the insurance for each individual art, artist. So. The insurance could be um, a little less for the the artist individually, so we wouldn't take that fifteen thousand and divide it by the artist. Okay. Does does the arts commission just absorb this into their budget, or is this an increase for them in their budget? They would have to absorb this into their budget if they choose to to implement the program. And that may be part of their decision whether to absorb it absorb the insurance or pass it on, pass it on to the artist. That's correct. 
Well, I know that there's a, a great demand for places in the city for community art. So, and I know you guys have worked really hard on this. I think it's a it's a good starting point. So, if there are no more questions, do we have a motion? To we need to um, we need to recommend approval of the policy to the Arts and Culture Commission. I'll make a motion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, to recommend approval of the policy as it's been presented to us uh, to the Arts and Culture Commission. Do I have a second? Second. I'll call roll call. Commissioner Scarpetian? Yes. On? Yes. Ruffles is absent. Sharkey is absent. President Patrick? Yes. And thank you again for all the work that you've done to put this together. I know the I know the artists will be out there being very happy that this is moving a step forward, so thank you. Okay, what's next? Next we have item 7A2. It's a resolution increasing the drop-by skate class fee for the Verdugo Skate Park and recommending that the Glendale City Council incorporate the fee into the comprehensive citywide fee schedule. Good afternoon, President Patrick, members Hi. of the Commission. Um, I'm Gabrielle Golia, the supervisor of the Glendale Sports Complex and Sports Section. Um, I'm here today with a resolution increasing the drop by skate class fee at the Verdugo Skate Park and recommending that the Glendale City Council incorporate the fee into the compre comprehensive citywide fee schedule. On August 20th, we submitted a report to you um, recommending the approval of a resolution modifying existing fees and establishing some new fees at the Verdugo Skate Park. Um, at that same time, we also requested or, or proposed some new uh, hours of operation at the skate park. And um, all of those were approved. However, we inadvertently left out the fee for the drop-by skate classes in the actual resolution. We did check with the city attorney's office, and uh, they've advised us that a separate resolution for this one omitted fee just needed to come back to you. Um, so that is why we're here today, and we're re respectfully requesting um, and recommending the adoption of this resolution. It will raise the drop-by skate, skate class fees from $15 to $20 per class. Um, we did increase all of the fees and establish the new fees on October 1st, and I'd like to take a moment really quickly just to give you an update on how those fees are going since I'm here. Um, thus far, we have uh, generated over $3,000 in revenue just in 11 days. Um, people have been responding quite favorably to the new fees. Um, we've heard from the parents mostly um, a lot of support. They, they've said I'd be very happy to pay for an annual pass in order to support the skate park and keep it open. Um, we have had a few non-resident adults say I don't want to pay the increased fee. They were already paying a fee but they didn't want to pay the increased fee and they left. Um, most of those were late in the evening when they came just before closing and didn't want to pay a fee just for 30 minutes of skate time. Um, we're, on average, we're bringing in about $275 a day. We anticipate that this will decrease because a lot of these are annual passes that are being purchased. Um, thus far, we've sold 46 adult daily passes, 62 youth daily passes, uh, 18 adult annual passes, and 26 youth annual passes. So our total is $3,020 just in entrance fees. Um, that is all that I have as far as this resolution. Um, and there's a little bit more information just on the hours of operation that's in your monthly activity report. But that this is what has to do with the fees for today. Okay. I have a question. You, you were giving us the numbers in the last 11 days, mm -hmm. and that's compared to what? Compared to what, we do, what were we doing before? Uh, attendance has not dropped. We haven't seen any significant drop. There might be one or two less that are coming in on a daily basis. Okay. Um, so compared to the month prior, which would have been September, it's about the same. We've, we've had no people come up, no families come up and say, I'm not going to pay for this. I don't want to enter. Okay. Um, it's just the handful. I think it's about three adults that have, have said no and they've left. So it's the, it's the same number approximately of participants. Mm -hmm. It's just what you told us was the increase that we've generate in revenue as a result of the fees increasing? Those are the actual sales okay. um, concerning the passes. Right. Yeah. Thanks. And there are no kids that come up and say, I can't, I can't do this. I don't have the money for this. 
So far, we've turned no one away. Um, okay. I have instructed staff, and we've been working with them, that if there is a family or a child that comes in and says that they can't afford to pay for the fee, um, that we allow them in and take down their name and their information so that we can possibly work with um, the Parks Commission, um, I'm sorry, not the Parks Commission, the Parks Foundation, yeah. in order to provide scholarships for okay. these families and children. Um, and right now, we're doing an inventory of those kids to, to see how much it might cost us and what the um, the standards for that that scholarship program might be okay all right any other questions all right then let's see what we need from this is a motion <laughs> yes uh, I make a motion that the Parks Recreation and Community Services Commission approve the resolution increasing the drop-by skate class fee at the Verdugo State Skate Park and recommending that the Glendale City Council incorporate the fee into the comprehensive citywide fee schedule. A second. Thank you. And I'll take roll call. Commissioner Scarpetian? Yes. Khan? Yes. Rob Fogel's absent. Sharkey's absent. President Patrick? Yes. Item 7B reports for information only at one summer day camp programs. Good afternoon. Um, President Patrick, members of the Commission, my name is Onik Bulanikian. I'm the Community Services Manager for the Recreation and Community Services Section. And I'll be talking about our Summer Day Camp, uh, 2012 Summer Day Camp program that we just had this past summer. Um, we offer nine different camps. Uh, camps ran through uh, June 18th uh, through August 17th for nine weeks. We go on the GOSD calendar. So when GUSD is off, that's when we're working and providing day camp services to uh, the community. Um, we have the following camps, school days, kinder camp, traveling teens, summer fun, fun camp, theater camp, visual arts camp, <coughs> our CIT counselor and training program, Glendale Camp Express, and our Maple Stars day camp. Um, camp locations were at our three community centers that we have, uh, Brand Park, Dunsmore Park, Verdugo, Griffith Manor, and Civic Auditorium. Um, I want to. I'm going to go and talk about each day camp. Uh, our first camp, uh, Cool Days uh, Pacific Community Center, we targeted uh, ages six through 12 years of age. Uh, camps were offered Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. for nine weeks. Um, we had over a dozen special needs uh, campers uh, with uh, high functioning autism, uh, ADHD. Uh, ADD and so on. So um, uh, we have a need for uh, having camps uh, with uh, special need campers. So I'm going to come back later on talk about that. Um, we have three GYA employees uh, that worked our camps. We like to employ uh, uh, our GYA employees to assist us. It's a, another set of eyes and ears to help our counselors and staff uh, monitor the kids. And we uh, were lucky enough to secure donations. Uh, uh, this summer to uh, have 29 children from Dorofope and Asensia that attended our camps. Um, they were uh, private, we secured private donations from the community, uh, about $2,950. And uh, that funded 29 children to uh, participate in our camp for free at no cost to them. Um, this is my favorite slide, the Stanley Cup visited. Uh, <laughs> Pacific Community Center. Um, I got a call from ABC7 uh, thanks to uh, Don. Uh, Don uh, referred uh, ABC7 uh, to my office. Uh, they wanted to uh, bring the Stanley Cup out to uh, the community in Glendale. Uh, the cup was on a studio tour, so instead of going to ABC7 and having their employees enjoy it, they allowed us to enjoy it. So uh, we sent out a press release, and within less than 24 hours, we had over 500 people, including 120 of our campers, um, join us at Pacific. Uh, we had a NHL uh, rep representative uh, bring the cup with the LA Kings mascot. And uh, basically, it was an event to remember. Uh, my six-year-old still talks about it. <laughs> so uh, I still do, too. So. Um, that was one of our highlights at Pacific. Um, we also have our kinder camp program at Pacific, ages four to five years. Camps are offered half a day, seven to one. We would like to have a full day camp, but 
NAPs are involved and we're not ready to uh, accommodate that service yet. Uh, but this is a real popular program. I know Commissioner Garbetian's uh, daughter, I believe, was in our camp last summer, 2011. Um, this was offered for nine weeks. Uh, camp included outdoor and indoor games, sporting activities, arts and crafts. We also took uh, multiple trips to the library. Uh, they had uh, the library once a week has story time, and we took our kids there, and they went ahead and uh, participated in the arts and crafts and story time. A total of 135 campers were uh, enrolled in our kinder camp um, through the nine weeks. Our traveling teens camp, this was also held at Pacific Community Center, ages 12 to 14, pre-teens. Uh, camps, again, were offered Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 6. Uh, we offered it for nine weeks. The teens explored Glendale and surrounding communities. Uh, they used, they walked to the Americana. They used the local Glendale Beeline. Uh, they went to the zoo. And um, next year, hopefully, they'll go to the California Science Center and see the new the space shuttle. So we're working on that. Can we go too? Yeah. <laughs> By all means, please. I tried to make it to Inglewood, but it didn't work out uh, over the weekend. We had a total of 81 campers uh, enrolled in our traveling teens camp. Um, Spar Heights, this is a ha half a day camp, ages 5 to 12. Um, start at 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, they enjoyed arts and crafts, sports. You know, we had um, some water activities for the kids. A total of 313 campers were uh, enrolled. 14 of the campers enrolled there also had special needs. So once again, we do have you know a need for a uh, special needs camp. Um, theater art civic uh, was at the civic auditorium. It was a two-week program, 11 to 2. Campers created, rehearsed, and performed their own uh, theater production. Uh, they explored you know improvisation and acting. Um, and television. Our next is the Visual Arts Camp at Griffith Manor. Um, campers were introduced to a variety of paintings, sculpting, ceramics, and uh, they were at Griffith Manor uh, for three hours a day for two weeks. Counselor in training, uh, this was held at Verdugo Park, ages 13 to 15. Um, campers were required to apply an interview for all positions. Um, I, we all like this program. I know staff likes the program because we basically train these participants, and our hope is for them to become, you know, hourly recreation leaders and camp counselors as they get older and go through uh, school and college. So we really take this uh, program very seriously, counselor and training, and we uh, train them to be counselors and what uh, train them in activities and so on. And we had a total of 15 campers, and I believe. Um, two of our employees this summer were uh, participants in the counselor and training program for a number of years. Um, Glendale Camp Express, Summer Discovery Camp, Band Park, no, again, ages 5 to 12. Camps were offered 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., nine weeks. Uh, we had a total of 410 campers. Uh, campers enjoyed arts and crafts, hikes, sports, and weekly swimming excursions. Um, Camps would, uh, every Thursday, they would take a trip to the Pacific Pool and uh, basically enjoy the facility, swimming and having a good time with their friends. Here's Brent Park Day Camp. We had a reptile show come in. Um, summer Blast Camp at Dunsmore, uh, same as Brent Park, uh, ages 5 to 15. We had weekly excursions, swimming, arts, and crafts. A total of 348 campers were enrolled. And the best part is campers had access to an air conditioning facility. I know when I was in day camp when I was younger, we were out and uh, it was hot. So uh, one good thing about our camps, most of our camps do have the air conditioning facilities. Here's Dunsmore Camp again. And then Verdugo Park, Summer Spectacular. This is our premier camp, including higher energy excursions. This is where we take the kids out to field trip Wednesdays, every Wednesday. They had swimming, arts and crafts, cookouts, hikes, and movies, and a total of 437 campers were enrolled. Here's another picture of them doing activities. <coughs> staff recommendations. Um, staff recommends that we uh, consolidate Dunsmore Camp with Verdugo Camp at Verdugo Park. Uh, move Brand Camp to Griffith Manor Community Building to increase enrollment 
as the location offers the air conditioning facility and estimate a budget savings by consolidating these camps would be an approximate of $18,350, which, which includes the bus rental fees, field trip costs, staffing, and supplies. Uh, we'd like to continue to market the program via the city's website, Facebook, the marketing booth, department brochures, the summer wrap-up, and the Glendale Unified School District folders. And um, talking about Facebook, our Facebook page is up, the department's Facebook page. So if anyone, uh, if the community has a Facebook page, you know, visit us at Community Services Parks, City of Glendale, and go ahead and like us. Uh, Norma Vias, she updates that. Um, I'm going to say on a daily basis, but I think on an hourly basis. Uh, so, yeah. once a day. Uh, so she's, uh, she's very, you know, proactive updating the page. Uh, we... Uh, you know, market the community events. We marketed the Duck Splash event, the K-9 event, and so on. So um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and call 548 818-548-2752. Okay, now you that or I can ask it now. Yes, now you, <laughs> you got that number, Rodney? <laughs> can, you go, can you go back to that last slide? The, sure. You need to make okay. a phone call first. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the reason you want to consolidate the Dunsmore and Verdugo is because we're not seeing the numbers that um, we thought we would? We are seeing the numbers, but instead of hiring extra um, a day camp director and an extra assistant day camp director, I, instead of hiring the extra staff, we can move that Dunsmore camp to uh, Verdugo Park. It's just staffing and basically saving, or cost cut, uh, saving, saving so, salary savings. And basically, savings and supplies. Okay, so it's not a. If we had more kids, you no, wouldn't need to do way. this. We're at our. Are we near our capacity with these camps? Most of the weeks we are. Yes, most yeah. of the weeks. I know with uh, cool days, spar heights, we're at capacity, um, but most of the weeks we are. But in order to save on staffing, um, we recommend to move Dunsmore to Verdugo, and then Brand Camp. Uh, move to Griffith Manor. Brand is a little dusty this year because of the the construction. So we like to uh, move Brand down to Griffith Manor and have them enjoy the brand new building that was built. Um, so this way, you know, we can probably get more enrollment there, and then uh, we can save around eighteen thousand. Okay. Thanks. Or not this fiscal year, next fiscal year. Yeah. <clears throat> Ask a question that kind of adds on to that. Um, Dunsmore and Verdugo Parks are kind of far away. Will the Dunsmore kids come to Verdugo Park? We're going to try it out for the summer of 2013. If it doesn't work out, then we'll go out and ha have a camp for the summer of 2014. Okay. We're going to market it to the parents saying we have a new facilities, air conditioning, and uh, this way, because Verdugo is our premier camp. Uh, and, and there is air conditioned facilities at Verdugo, Verdugo Park? Verdugo, yes, they do okay. have a... Uh, they use the uh, word dad's club. They use the dad's club oh, facility. Okay. Yeah, because you, you said Dunsmore had air conditioning. Yes, they, so. they, they would use the community building. <laughs> okay. So all of our uh, camps will have air conditioning facilities, okay. uh, which I think is a good thing, uh, especially in the summer. Questions? No, just a comment. I think it's great that you're getting a head start on the cutbacks for next year by saving that $18,000 because we're going to have to find more savings for sure. We're trying to increase revenue uh, by providing the air conditioning facility, safer environment, it's an enclosed environment, plus uh, decrease in uh, hourly salaries and supplies and bus transportation and so on. All that adds up. Uh -huh. One other comment for you. You mentioned about the Pacific... Was it the Pacific facility that you have? Um, I think it's the four or five year olds, and you said you you're trying to figure out you have the capacity, but they have a nap time. The nap time, and it's a, a licensing issue too. So do I, well, we need to get license to the childcare facility, I believe. Oh, okay. And that um, uh, that's uh, uh, we can look into that, but I'm not sure how we're going to get how if the city will allow us to get license. So the licensing care. is one issue? It's a licensing issue, yes. Okay. Thanks. Licensing issue, NAP issue, and so on. Okay. Well, I certainly know that these camps are very necessary in the community to parents that work and want their kids to have good things to do during the summer. So great program. 
yeah, all of our camps, I mean, they're great. And um, uh, within the next couple of months, we're going to come back to commission with uh, uh, basically um, a scholarship package and uh, trying to, uh, I guess, a scholarship um, requirements on who's eligible for a scholarship and who's not, because we are getting a lot of requests uh, for scholarships. Uh, not a lot, a number of requests, about 15, 20 a summer. And uh, we would like to, you know, secure donations uh, for the uh, participants that can't, can't uh, afford uh, the camps. Yeah, I just want to congratulate you as well. This is a, these are all great programs. And I want to con congratulate our, our instructors as well, because two of my three kids, they participated in the theater art camp. And it's amazing, within two weeks, what kind of a play they have, because we went to the, to the end, of, end of the two weeks, they have a play that you can go watch, and it was, it was amazing. And they are very independent, and they participate in making the decor and uh, the, the whole story and everything. It was, it was a great event, so yeah. congratulations as well. Thank you. Yeah. We, do, uh, we do our best trying to hire the number one you know, employees and employees that do have camp experience, that do have college education, you know, one year or two year, and that do ha that like to basically, you know, hang out with kids and uh, participate in activities with them. So all of our employees, you know, do, do a good job. Be sure that you um, keep the Parks Foundation in the loop with a scholarship. Oh, yes, yes. Thanks, yeah. also. That's on okay. our list. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And what is next? Next we have item 7B2, Civic Auditorium Annual Report. Good afternoon, President Patrick, members of commission. My name is Laura Dalian. I'm the Community Services Supervisor for the Civic Auditorium. And I'm here today to give you the annual report presentation for the Civic Auditorium. The Glendale Civic Auditorium was built in 1937 to serve the community and is still performing that function today. It truly stands as a lasting symbol of the old and the new. The Civic Auditorium is an enterprise uh, operation and it's a perfect location for uh, meetings, private events, receptions, weddings, birthday parties, dinner dances, festivals, we hold conventions, seminars, trade shows, concerts, trainings, sport activities, and many more. The Civic Auditorium includes, uh, the services include the adjacent parking. We accommodate up to 500 car spaces at one time. We provide security guard service, insurance, handicap accessibility, audiovisual services, Wi-Fi connection, it is a convenient, safe location for all type of events. We all also assist the city's special events with our deliveries. The Civic Auditorium consists of two halls. Upper Auditorium accommodates up to 1,100 people, has 11,000 square feet hardwood floor, open space, high ceilings. It's a formal auditorium, um, and it has wide entrances. 1,100 people accommodates for a theater seating and 800 people banquet seating with a dance floor. It has adjacent areas, terrace room, that is a room by itself, it's a breakout room, north foyer, commercial food kitchen, and dressing rooms. And the designated parking for this auditorium is the garage structure. Here you see different setups for the upper auditorium from different events. In the top left one, you can see the commemorative event with lots of dignitaries during that event, and once we had hosted also a former governor, uh, Gray Davis, during that event. The next to the picture is from a smaller banquet, private event. In the bottom you see two separate setups, different setups with uh, tables uh, and the open space dance floor area, and on the right is a ballroom dance. The lower auditorium is as spacious as upstairs, but has different construction. It has a middle sunken dance floor, accommodates up to 600 people for dinner dances, banquets, exhibits, receptions, and festivals. 
It is a favorite hall for sweet sixteens, quinceaneras, bar mitzvahs, weddings. Adjacent areas for the, com uh, for the lower auditorium we have is commercial full kitchen, south courtyard, conference room, designated parking is lot 31. Here you see different pictures of the lower auditorium, shows the unique sunken area that can serve as a dance floor, and in the bottom you see also a luncheon from a dig dignitary event. The civic auditorium uh, looks different with all type of setups. And here we have different pictures from different events. This is a North foyer, probably you've seen it blank and empty visiting the auditorium during the weekday. It converts into a hall by itself. This is from a, a continuous or one of the antique show, uh, shows that uses this area to have it as an exhibit hall. This is the lower auditorium event from martial arts that we used to hold. Uh, the book, book fair in the upper auditorium uh, the, the square dance event, uh, wedding reception, uh, another antique show, show. This is a, from a pottery show. Uh, this is our also North Foyer area converted into a lounge uh, during one of the bridal shows. This is from bridal show. Um, this is the boxing event that was broadcasted by, by the ESPN Famous event. Um, <laughs> concert, another bridal show. Uh, this event we held several years ago when um, H1N1 flu shot was conducted at the Civic Auditorium and we had over 3,000 people lined up outside for this event. The Civic Auditorium is also a very important location for city events. We are the emergency operations center for the city of Glendale. Um, we also, uh, the city also uses the civic auditoriums for citywide trainings, job applicants personnel tests, citywide meetings, city special events. We assist our customers with event planning, uh, civic event permits, we draw the diagram for the events, we set up and break down for the events, we provide with logistics, event management and operation, and of course, uh, with the deliveries to various uh, city-wide functions out, outside of the building. Uh, as you see, the Civic Auditorium is a very versatile venue that truly benefits the city of Glendale. This concludes my presentation. If you have questions, please. Yes. If they want to list a place, who do they contact? I'm if, sorry? If, if somebody wants to rent a place for one night or what have you, for a party or for, for an event, who do they contact? Do they contact you? They or? contact me, correct. And could you? And my number is 818-548-2787. And could you uh, give us a, a brief on the, on the rental rates of the, of the sure. auditorium? The Civic Auditorium does not have a daily flat fee. So every event rate is different based on their specific requirements. We strictly follow the rate structure that is approved by you. However, again, every event can be different based on the hours of the rental, the equipment, the amount of the equipment they want to rent for their event, and other services that have to be assisted with their event request. So it can vary from 1000 to $10,000 based on their requirements. Okay. A big range, but that's fine. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Kahn. Uh, a few questions. One is that I, I look at the way um, the, you have a bullet point or breakdown where it seems like, especially on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, it's almost no rental at all. It's like 1%, 1% Monday, 1% Tuesdays, and 2% Wednesdays. Is there a way that we're looking at to market it more for those days? And if so, can you shed some light on that? Sure. Uh, actually, let me do a little addition on, on that. During the week, we have 
some rentals actually we're pretty busy almost on daily basis we have something going on at the civic auditorium however as far as the revenue it does not generate too much revenue for example tuesdays thursdays we have red cross blood drives consistently coming to us throughout the many years that we have now on th on wednesdays we have folk dance classes these are smaller events but they are consistent the work amount that we load to provide the service almost the same as with any kind of event. However, the revenue-wise, we do not generate too much revenue. And uh, the reason we cannot go for bigger events because of our limitation with the parking, uh, if we have to book a full function during the weekday, then we have to negotiate with the Glendale College. As you know, we have the power, power agreement with the Glendale College, and during the weekdays, our parking spaces pretty much belong to them. As far as it goes, uh, increasing our revenue, yes, definitely. We are looking through completing our website. Finally, hopefully, we'll get our own website, will give us exposure independently, and we're thinking to upgrade with the support of our administrators. We're thinking to upgrade our interior, attract also uh, more businesses uh, walking Big, bigger events from uh, outside local catering halls. We're getting into partnership with them. Uh, we're looking into new uh, sources, investigating of revenue going to corporate businesses and sport activities. Yes. I've got a couple of questions. One, I noticed in the report um, it looks like in the last year we lost $273,000? Correct. We are running a deficit, but over the past three, four years, our, rev our deficit has been reduced uh, dramatically, actually. Um, and we are expecting more reduction. And um, the ways to reduce is we're looking into a better way of operation, cutting down on our expenses by better way of monitoring opening and closing building hours and scheduling the staff accordingly that will help us to cut down on the expenses utilities we also had already a cut on our staffing as you know um, we are also looking into new way of uh, reviewing and new way of conducting our outside vendors for our maintenance services and lots of services that right now we're paying and getting from outside probably will be doing in-house or at least bidding and getting better prices. So we're hoping definitely to reduce that deficit more. And then if somebody comes in and rents the facility, do we charge them for parking or is that included in the rental? Correct. We charge them for the parking. It's $6 per parking space for the attendees coming attending to the events that it, they have a permit with us. We have a parking attendant sitting at the parking booth collecting the money and directing to their designated parking area. However, the promoters, the person who signs the contract, they have also a, a, a ways of kind of helping their attendees by prepaying for the parking, and we have a flat fee also confirmed and approved by you. And do we charge for Wi-Fi, or is that included? No, currently we have a very limited Wi-Fi. Um, it is kind of incorporated with our telephone bill and with a charter. It's very slow. We don't have uh, antenna. Oh. It's just a very limited Wi-Fi connection. Because I, I think and we with, do not charge for that, no. With more and more meetings, especially business type meetings, that, that's very important. That's absolutely true. It's going to be our one way of our selling tools to, if we have a good Wi-Fi connection, to advertise that. And, and lastly, I'm, in the pictures that you used, I'd go back, and I know it's a couple years old, but I would go back and pull out one or two pictures from the city's 100th anniversary because I've never seen that room look more beautiful than that night, and that was really a great event. We had centennial event. I think one of the picture actually was we had a centennial event several years ago that was uh, at the Civic Auditorium. Yes, it was a very historic moment for us. Uh, the, the reason why it was so pretty too, because we had lots of sponsors. They worked almost two days to decorating 
that hall. Yes, that's correct. And that's how the civic auditorium changes with every decoration, with every way of uh, dressing it up. It changes completely. One minute we are a uh, uh, commercial gun show event. Next minute we are this luxury banquet hall that you can compare with a Ritz-Carlton room. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank we appreciate you. all the time on, on the report. It's a, it's a great facility and we're lucky to have it. Okay, what's next? Item 7B3, monthly activity reports at A, Human Services. Uh, good afternoon, uh, President uh, Patrick, members of the Commission. Uh, Moises Correa with uh, Human Services and Parks, the Human Services section. Um, we actually don't have a formal report today. We are actually just um, I'm going to give you some information on a couple of events that we're having this year, well, actually this month. The first one is our Homeless and Senior Connect Day, which is scheduled for December 14th. That's uh, a Friday right now that is uh, tentatively for the National Guard Armory. Now, that event is a joint event now with um, the Homeless Services Section and Senior Services Section to bring um, services and information to our senior population as well as the homeless population. The Homeless Connect Day is an annual event, but we as staff decided to bring on those services, those um, uh, information to the senior population. That way we can combine both um, services for, for one day. But we expect to have a number of um, agencies participate in um, this Connect Day, and you'll see there's health fairs, and there's health information, mental health services, the counseling, uh, government benefits. So we think that this would be a event that certainly we'd like the commissioners to to drop by and and, and just uh, see how it uh, it's, it's flowing. And we expect to be there for several hours from 10 to 2 p.m. There is uh, lunch provided by one of our um, our local uh, restaurants, I believe Tres Hermanas is providing the lunch for us. So it would be a really good event to, to drop by if you haven't been to our Homeless Connect Day. Next. And lying with uh, Human Services in the month of Thanksgiving, um, spirit of Thanksgiving, we are conducting our annual food drive. Our food drive starts from October 31st to November 16th. That is with the Senior Services section, and that would uh, essentially a city event where we're actually taking canned food from the city employees so that the city employees begin to, to uh, drop off uh, perishable food, whether it's cans or it's um, other items and liquids to some boxes that we have throughout the city, city hall, the yards, um, so that we, of course, as employees, um, give back to the community. And this food is for these homebound seniors that are not able to get out and get food, especially during Thanksgiving when it's really challenging for, for a lot of people. So we, again, as employees, we will kick this off on October 31st, which is our actual annual, um, I guess it's ho holiday. Employee Human Relations. Employee Human Relations um, Pot potluck. It's our employees' um, potluck, and it'll be kicked off October 31st. And that is a costume event, so you want to come by definitely for that and see us all in costumes. But we're kicking it off. Employees have always been very generous to provide um, what they can for this food drive, which is very, as we know, the economy continues to be a challenge. And this, again, is something that we really believe that uplifts, especially the seniors that are at home, that um, provided um, at least for the winter season, the, the food and and. Um, the drinks and liquids and um, other items as needed. So, okay. where is it going to be? A the potluck party. The potluck would be here in the Perkins Plaza, up here in the in Plaza area. Because I would like to see Mr. Tatevosian in. in I <laughs> I believe he is dressing up. Uh, Community Service and Parks has a theme of Italy. I believe it's Italy. Um, we also have a theme mm -hmm. for our costumes, which would be um, superheroes. So, as Community Services Parks. Um, <laughs> you know, lessons and numbers, but we're still very strong in what we do, and so we'll, we'll see what kind of creativity happens here with the, uh, the department. So expect um, a number of us to be in costume that day. <laughs> so, so if uh, some of us wanted to bring food to donate, we can do it that day? Absolutely, yes. If you like to bring um, any food, as 
you know, as you, as you may, to any of our um, centers or at the event itself. An event starts from, I believe, 11.30 to about 1.30 p.m. By centers, do you mean like Spar Heights, the Adult Recreation Center, those kind of places Correct. also? Correct. It would be at the um, Community Center, Spar Heights, Pacific, Maple, um, is, ARC. And is this only for employees or can anyone? Oh, anyone can donate. Again, we're, we're reaching out. We'll be reaching out to some community agencies, some of the schools. The schools do their own food drives. So I believe Glenville Unified has their own drive. And so certainly there's a need there as well. But we'll be working maybe some schools, some local private schools to help us collect more this year. Because I think the need is actually more so this year than any other year. So. And then what about the uh, Homeless Connect Day? Do you know where it's going to be yet? Uh, right now, it's tentatively at the National Guard Armory, where it has been for a number of years, but we haven't um, confirmed that yet. Uh, our second choice is St. Mary's um, Church on Central Avenue, but right now we, we are tentatively at the Armory for um, Homeless and Senior Connect Day. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Two very good programs. Thank you. And what is next? Next we have item 7B3B, Workforce Development. Good afternoon, uh, President Patrick and Commissioners. Uh, I'm Don Nakamoto, the uh, Administrator in Workforce Development. Uh, every year uh, we have uh, an analysis we, analysis we do of the uh, local labor market and the local economy and do some projections on what we think uh, the direction of the economy will go. So I just wanted to give you a brief presentation about uh, where we think our economy is going and where it's been at. Um, our local unemployment rate remains pretty high uh, in the Glendale Burbank area. It's about 9.8 percent, which is about 2 percent over the uh, national level. A lot of our industries locally uh, are still pretty far off from recovering uh, employment-wise uh, compared to pre-recession levels. And our situation is pretty similar to the national economy. Um, our national economy, uh, just for some background, uh, has been improving. The uh, labor market has been improving, but very slowly. Uh, we've only regained about half the uh, private sector jobs that were lost, uh, the 8 million jobs that were lost during the recession. An area to be concerned about is the government uh, employment. That's been uh, going down pretty significantly over the last four years and is expected to uh, continue to uh, hemorrhage. But things are uh, improving. Uh, during the height of the recession, uh, around July of 2009, there were 6.7 unemployed people for every job opening, and this is at a national level. Uh, and as a local example, we had between 9,000 and 10,000 visits to the Verdugo Job Center per month. Uh, so we were just overwhelmed with local people that were looking for work. Uh, things have uh, come down a little bit. Um, we're seeing at a national level 3.7 unemployed people for every job opening now. So you can see there is some improvement in the, uh, the economy and the labor market. As far as our local situation uh, in the Glendale Burbank area, uh, motion pictures, television is our most dominant industry and that's still pretty far off from pre-recession levels. A big concern in that industry is that uh, the film, uh, the motion picture industry hasn't been doing well for a fairly long time and uh, television work locally was picking up that slack for employees and keeping them employed. But we've seen a recent trend where that's, uh, the television work is really starting to drop off now too and it's starting to become a bigger concern for our uh, local economy. Uh, a little bit more information about that. Um, this kind of gives you a sense of the drop off we've seen in motion pictures. Uh, 2000 we had 272 films that were shot in the state and now uh, in 2008 that's down to uh, 160. Um, it's resulted in a loss of about three billion in state wages and loss of 90,000 jobs. Uh, and it, it is a big industry uh, covering almost 200,000 people in the state. And a lot of those jobs are concentrated in the Verdugo area, the Glendale Burbank area. We have a lot of production people that either live 
or um, work in our region. As I mentioned, the, uh, the whole television area is a big concern. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, TV drama is a pretty big area uh, for employing people. They employ about 840 people for every uh, network television um, series drama. Um, only two of 23 uh, television dramas that were shot, in, were shot in L.A. County last year, or this year, I'm sorry, uh, and to give you an idea of the comparison, in 2005, 80% of all television dramas were shot in L.A. So there's been a huge drop-off in just that segment. Uh, we still have some work that's occurring in the, the comedy area and uh, reality television, but uh, again, that work uh, is starting to seriously go down, so it's a big concern for our region. And again, a lot of the people working in... Uh, television uh, live and work in our region. Uh, Health care, uh, a lot of economists thought that this was an area that was recession proof because a lot of the services can't be uh, sent overseas or contracted out. Uh, but uh, we did suffer some employment loss. We're still down about 10 percent compared to pre-recession levels. Um, a lot of people have, uh, during the recession, were deferring uh, health care services and Unfortunately, that's still the case. Um, the good news is that uh, the whole servicing model for health care is changing from the hospital level and the doctor level um, because there's an anticipation that there's going to be a lot more volume of patients, uh, especially lower income patients that are eligible and going to be accessing service. I think uh, one study I saw said there's going to be about 1.7 uh, additional 1.7 million additional people in LA County that will be accessing um, health care services in uh, 2014. So there's expected to be a big uh, push for uh, additional services, and that's going to mean additional jobs created in that area. So because our area is so heavily uh, concentrated into the health care sector, uh, that should be good news for us employment wise. Uh, another big sector for us, the retail sector, that's still off about 10% uh, from pre-recession levels. Uh, just a side note, the accommodation and food services was only off very slightly, so people must have been still eating during the recession and afterwards in the recovery. Uh, and manufacturing, uh, that's been actually enjoying a pretty good rebound uh, during the recovery. Uh, the employment level is only off about 4% from pre-recession levels. Uh, in the last two to three months, though, we've seen a slowdown in that area because of, uh, you may have heard about the fiscal cliff at the federal level. Uh, there's a lot of concern what's going to happen to uh, the expiration of tax breaks and uh, other issues. And also the economies in uh, Europe and Asia are uh, declining pretty rapidly, so that's had an effect on our local uh, manufacturing sector. Uh, one area that's been up pretty dramatically has been an area called professional and technical services. Uh, it's now the fourth largest employer in the Verdugo region. Uh, so that en encompasses things like uh, architectural services, law firms, law services, uh, accounting services. And so um, we've benefited by uh, some uh, attorney offices or legal services moving into the uh, Glendale area in recent years. So um, that's been a pretty promising area. Uh, as could be expected, the industries that are tied to the uh, recession, finance, construction, real estate, they're all still down pretty substantially, and it doesn't look like there's going to be uh, any significant improvement in the near future. Uh, where do we go from here? There's a lot of mixed opinions at this point. Uh, some people think we're going into a mild recession in early 2013. Uh, some people think that if the fiscal cliff issue is not resolved, we're headed for a much deeper recession in the first and second quarter of 2013. But most people, uh, most economists think that we're going to muddle through our current situation. Uh, longer term, you may be uh, familiar with the fact that the Federal Reserve stepped in again with uh, they call it quantitative easing number three, and uh, 
their strategy and this uh, uh, event that they did uh, was to keep mortgage rates really low. And it may actually have a, a good impact going forward on our uh, national economy. Um, let's see, next slide. Um, because they're keeping the mortgage rates really low, we've seen a record uh, refinancing activity. Uh, rates are at uh, decade level lows. Uh, so this is putting more money into consumers' hands. It's uh, creating more retail jobs. Um, it's helping borrowers uh, access uh, loans. And it's also having an impact in the housing market. Uh, we've seen the highest home sales in the last six years in Southern California and the highest home prices in Southern California in the last four years. Uh, also, it's uh, increasing, um, reducing household debt by refinancing activity. Uh, we're seeing a better housing market, so that's improving the situation with construction and finance. And uh, it's helping people who are underwater in their loans uh, be able to refinance. So if this strategy is uh, somewhat successful, we could see a local impact in areas like uh, entertainment, health care, finance, construction, and we'll have to monitor these situations uh, more closely as we move forward. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Don, you mentioned that um, at the peak you were seeing about nine or 10,000 people per month mm -hmm. at the Verdugo Job Center. What are you seeing today? Uh, today it's about uh, 4,500. Uh, a few months ago we had probably dropped down to about 3,000 to 3,500. But the state has a new program in to try and specifically focus on people that are considered uh, long-term unemployed. They've been long, uh, unemployed longer than 26 weeks. And so they've started calling in those people and we're providing services to them. So that's um, temporarily inflated our numbers, but uh, I would say probably on average we're looking at about three to four thousand in. So it, things are improving. You can see. Thanks. Okay. Question. Yep. Um, you you touched on the, the problem of television and movie uh, production leaving the LA area. What's what's being done? What can be done? Um. A lot of the labor unions and um, some other organizations have focused on the tax incentives because uh, a big reason for the loss of jobs is other states have become really aggressive, such as New York and states in the South, in putting together big packages to try and entice uh, companies to move their productions from Southern California to those areas. and. They're looking not necessarily at uh, the gain that the states will get, but the economic impact in creating jobs. And so um, the state came up with an incentive with a total pool of about, I think it's $100 million that was recently approved. And it's focused mostly on small types of productions, I think $10 million or less. Um, but in comparison, some of the other states are coming in with a lot more money to try and uh, entice uh, productions to uh, other states. And other foreign countries are also stepping in with incentives as well. So it's going to be a difficult fight. And uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of people that are tied to that industry locally. And you mentioned manufacturing. What kind of manufacturing do we have in the Glendale Burbank area? Uh, I would say the majority of that is uh, tied to uh, past connections to the aerospace industry with Lockheed at Burbank. A lot of um, just hundreds and hundreds of smaller companies that subcontracted in the aerospace defense area um, were based in Glendale and Burbank. And um, the numbers come down quite a bit over the years, but they're still a pretty good sized group. Um, I think it's the fourth largest industry in the Glendale Burbank area that are still in business and still uh, selling to um, aerospace defense. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one final thing I'd like to hand out. Um, some newsletters. Uh, 
I mentioned in past meetings that we identified a skills skills gaps in our our region where employers are having difficulty finding the skilled labor they need. Uh, some companies have gone overseas to hire workers um, locally. Uh, some have contra contracted out work to other states and other countries. And so we created this newsletter as a tool to help uh, education see where the local demand is in what industries, what future occupations, and also as a tool to let um, the employers know that we have uh, educational institutions that are working to tr try to help fill uh, some of those needs in the future. So uh, at your convenience, you can take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. What is next? Next is item 7B3C, Park Planning and Development. Uh, good afternoon, members of the commission. Uh, I don't have any updates for you this afternoon. However, we have the pleasure of uh, Mr. Mark Sturdivant this afternoon, uh, uh, our senior administrative analyst with Parks, to give us a, a brief presentation on the success of our Trails and Open Space program. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. President Patrick, members of the commission, I'm Mark Sturdivant, senior analyst for the department. And I'm here um, actually to bring you up to date on two exciting new uh, trail projects that uh, we're going to be embarking on in the next few weeks. Um, over the past couple of years, we've received uh, two grants from two separate sources for trail building. One uh, was a grant from the Recreational Trails Program in the amount of $196,102 for an ADA accessible trail. And this uh, money comes from the Federal Highway Administration and is administered through California State Parks. And we're using this on a trail that we are calling the San Rafael Hills Mountain Dew Trail. And the other was a grant from um, an L.A. County competitive grant program, uh, and that was in the amount of $123,472 for an intermediate level trail. This money comes from L.A. County's Proposition A and is administered through the L.A. County Regional Parks and Open Space District. And this grant will be used on uh, our new Catalina Verdugo Trail. And both these trails will be located at the Glendale Sports complex. Uh, as you can see by this slide, the Mountain Dew Trail will make use of an existing service road around the southern portion of the sports complex. We're going to convert this into a multi-user trail uh, accommodating persons with physical and cognitive disabilities, as well as hikers, joggers, senior citizens, children, and all those who are physically unable to hike uh, Glendale's <laughs> other outdoor trails. And we selected the sports complex because of our desire to integrate rather than isolate our accessible trail. Not only does the complex offer a natural outdoor location that can easily be modified to accommodate users uh, with disabilities, it also provides the greatest opportunity to provide access for these users. So what's this trail going to be like? Well, it's uh, an existing service road that extends for about three quarters of a mile around the southern part of the sports complex. And it will be covered with a uh, hardened, decomposed granite surface that will uh, make it accessible to wheelchairs. Uh, the road is about 12 feet wide at its narrowest spot. Uh, it possesses an average running slope of less than 5% and a cross slope of less than 2%, so that makes it perfect to conform to ADA requirements. And approximately 185 feet um, at the far eastern end of the trail will have to be graded uh, in order to reduce the slope and make it ADA compliant. The trail is going to feature two rest areas, one on the southern end of the property and one on the eastern end, and these rest areas will include uh, ADA accessible picnic tables as well as accessible outdoor exercise stations. 
Um, here's an example of the kind of fitness stations we're referring to. Uh, it's our intention to have several of these stations designed to provide strengthening, flexibility, and balance activities uh, that address the needs of people with mobility impairments as well as those uh, of active older adults. And for those who ask, can you make an old service road attractive, I think you'll find that this one is actually going to be pretty nice, as you can see from the photos there. Um, you know, I've been out on that trail and that service road numerous times uh, over the last couple of years, and I've seen a lot of deer along the trail in the morning and hawks soaring overhead in the afternoons. And everyone asks, why are we calling it the Mountain Dew Trail? Well, it's because it's going to give a substantial number of our residents the opportunity to do something that they haven't had the chance to do before, namely to enjoy a recreational experience in Glendale's great outdoors. Now, as you can see by this map, um, this is the Catalina Verdugo Trail. The Mountain Dew Trail is outlined in red, and the Catalina Verdugo Trail is in yellow. Uh, it's meant to provide a relatively easy intermediate level trail, unlike many of our steeper trails in the Verdugos and in the San Gabriel Mountains. The Catalina Verdugo Trail will be approximately 8,900 feet in length. The trailhead will be located at the south end of the sports complex, and it will meander in and out of uh, the canyons and the ridgelines and uh, do this at a pretty easy grade and will be uh, it will complete a loop by coming back around to the north end of the, uh, of the sports complex. Along the way, the trail will feature benches, interpretive signage, and rest areas. It's also going to connect to an existing fire road that you can see there. That's the Ridge Motorway. It's at the top of the San Rafael Hills, and this connection will open up numerous linkages to additional trails in fire roads in Glendale and in La Cañada Flint Ridge. And the trail is going to offer some pretty spectacular views, as you can see here. And uh, along the way, we'll interpret the human history of Glendale and the Verdugo Valley, home of Catalina Verdugo. That's why we've named the trail um, after her. She's the first lady of the Rancho San Rafael, as I'm sure most of you know, who made the Verdugo Doby her home. So whether you're a hiker or you're going to access uh, Glendale's great outdoors by other means, we think that the Mountain Dew Trail and the Catalina Verdugo Trail will have something for just about everyone. With that, I would be happy to take your questions. Questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, the Mountain Dew Trail, it's not a loop, right? It just ends and you have to come back? How, how no, does that it, work? it starts and ends um, in the parking lot. So okay. you could actually start at one end, take the loop around, and then, like, Go back to your car in the parking lot. Very good. So it's not, not out and back. Great. Thank you. Yes. How are you enjoying retirement? <laughs> uh, so far, I haven't gotten to see too much of it, so uh, I'm not sure yet. I'm still getting used to it. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I do have one other announcement I wanted to make, and that is this. Um, this Saturday at Duke Majin Park at 11 a.m., uh, the Trails and Open Space program is going to be hosting a volunteer appreciation brunch. Um, as I think you know from previous visits here, we've um, established over the last year a pretty robust Trails and Open Space program, largely centered around um, the community and community volunteers. We have volunteers that have done an extraordinary job helping us restore the park after the station fire. We have an absolutely incredible trail maintenance crew. It's a, a dedicated group of people who hike way back into the park to make our trails safe. In fact, they just finished um, the Rim of the Valley Trail that goes up to the Haynes Canyon Fire Road, and for the first time since the fire, that trail is fully open and completely safe, and they've done an outstanding job. We have uh, our interpreters who come and lead our hikes and do our lectures and our campfire programs are all volunteers, and we even have uh, gardeners. Um, crazy people who think that weeding landscaped areas of the park is actually something that uh, they get a big charge out of. I don't know why they do it, but bless them, they do. Um, so we have, we have those folks as well. And we are going to be recognizing um, several of those people who have really gone above and beyond the call of duty uh, in their willingness to 
volunteer and give back to the park. Anyone who has volunteered in the park, so Mr. Rob Fogel, you're good to go, is welcome to come to the brunch, because Mr. Rob Fogel has been out working in the park in the past, and of course commissioners, um, by virtue of the fact that you are commissioners, uh, you're certainly welcome to attend as well. So um, put it on your calendar, it's this Saturday, 11 a.m., we'll be in the picnic area, we'll have some nice food and beverages and acknowledge the good work of our volunteers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. What is next? 7B3D Park Services. Good afternoon. I am the uh, Senior Park Services Manager, and I will be joining you every month here trying Welcome. to fill Gary's big shoes. Thank you. We're happy to have you here. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, he teach you how to make PowerPoint presentations? Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. Although, on a sad note, you won't be seeing our first PowerPoint presentation today. I know we were scheduled to show you some of our restructuring changes uh, based on the layoffs that we had faced uh, and, uh, you know, some of the uh, retirements that we experienced. Uh, we had a plan in place, however, due to uh, the water and power cutbacks, as you know, individuals who had bumping rights, it actually affected our section uh, last week, where about six of our guys were um, affected based on their positions. Two of them were reduced, uh, dropped down to a lower classification, and four were pretty much laid off and sent home. We're still in that transition phase where, based on the number of retirements that are going to be submitted to the city from the different groups, including IBW, Water and Power, that may change, although our staff was sent home effective Wednesday last week. So our restructuring at this point in time is in somewhat of a flux. Most of the major key points remain the same. It's a matter of who we're going to get back in and where, are we going, where we're going to be placing these individuals is where we are at right now. Uh, in terms of an overall effect, our net gain sh will be zero, uh, and it's just a matter of new personnel filling in for who we had if everything is consistent. Therefore, uh, look forward for that uh, presentation next month okay. with a little greater detail. Um, Although going forward, there are some positives I'd like to share with you. I mean, I think the greatest resource we have are our staff. In these last couple of months where we've had the reductions, our managers, supervisors, and frontline staff have been able to keep up with the workload in the heavy summer months, which is our greatest, greatest use of the facilities. Uh, credit goes out to them. And uh, a couple of additional positives coming. We have been working with the uh, Information Services Department on implementing a... Uh, a work management system, a city works Azteca, and I'm happy to announce today that effective this morning, uh, we went live on our work order segment, service request and work order segment of that project, whereas uh, any calls we get now will be entered into a specific system, so in the future months you'll start seeing a little change in the uh, report that we present to you. Uh, they will be directly from the system, um, possibly a little more detail. And if the uh, commissioners will allow me, every month we will try and look at a couple of minor projects that we do, small projects, rather than detail it in bullets. We'd like to highlight it in pictures because for our viewing audience, pictures do sell, you know, a thousand words. It's, it's a lot greater to view and see what our guys do. Uh, we do a lot more than just pick up the trash and do the uh, restroom maintenance. And we want to start highlighting that to the uh, community. And the credit for that actually goes out to uh, Nicole Del Mora and Aram Makarian in our office who would take the responsibility of completing and doing all the work orders, the in data entry into the system themselves to take that leeway from the managers who can spend more time supervising and, and conducting projects in the field. That is all we have for today. Next month, look forward for that restructuring uh, presentation. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Thank you very much. And next? Next we have 7B3E, Recreation and Community Services. Good afternoon. Um, Unik Bulanikian, uh, Community Services Manager of the Recreation and Community Services Section. Um, monthly activity report for this month has been submitted. Um, but what I want to talk about today uh, is our restructuring, uh, how we restructured. Um, last fiscal year, 2011-2012, uh, our section had 27 full-time employees, uh, three community services managers, eight supervisors, six coordinators, four specialists, two custodial workers, one park maintenance supervisor, two gardeners, and a laborer. Um, these are 20, I'm sorry, 27 
full-time employees. It's fine. Um, we had five retirements from our section, two community services managers, a community services coordinator who didn't take the early retirement. She retired August of 2011, but we're counting her as a retirement. So she's no longer with us. Um, one community services specialist and a park maintenance supervisor. So total retirement is five, which leaves us to 16 full-time employees for this fiscal year. One manager, seven supervisors, four coordinators, two specialists, and two custodial workers. Uh, two gardeners and the laborer that were on the previous slide for last fiscal year, uh, we moved them over from sports complex, um, park maintenance operations, into uh, Coco section, uh, park maintenance, uh, and consolidated services. Um, restructuring, we had uh, the Youth and Family Services Program, which was under the Human Services section. Um, the Youth and Family Services Supervisor moved to Pacific Community Center, and we consolidated both programs. We consolidated Pacific Facility Operations with the Youth and uh, Family Operations. So we have um, one supervisor there um, supervising both programs. We moved the Community Services Supervisor from Brand Studios to Civic Auditorium to uh, assist in Civic Auditorium operations day camps, special events, customer service office, because uh, the manager over there retired uh, last fiscal year. Our aquatics coordinator was moved back to the sports complex to assist in the daily operation of the sports and recreation unit. So um, even though she'll be still overseeing the aquatic section, her office will be at the sports complex to handle facility permits, uh, the skate park, and um, reservations of the city white fields. Uh, we moved the Maple Park Community Services Coordinator to Senior Case Management to assist in the Human Services section. Um, since the Human Services uh, section Senior Care Management at the ARC in Spar Heights, they had uh, one retirement, uh, take the early retirement, so we went ahead and uh, transferred a coordinator from youth programs to support uh, the Senior Services section. Um, with that being said, we have one full-time employee working at Maple Park, running the programming, the facility operations, rentals, and events at the center. And then, like I mentioned before, sports complex field maintenance, which was under the recreation and community services section, has been moved to the park section to consolidate services and uh, for us to be a little bit more efficient. Um, the next three slides will be our organizational chart. Um, the community centers unit will have one, uh, one manager and the four community centers. Each of the four community centers will have uh, a supervisor, facility supervisor. Then under the facility supervisor, there'll be coordinators or specialists assisting the supervisor. So we have the adult recreation center with one supervisor and one coordinator uh, coordinating senior programming one full-time custodial worker uh, assisting in facility maintenance and operation. Uh, at Pacific Community Center, we have one supervisor, we have one coordinator uh, in charge of center-based activities, and we currently have a specialist, a vacant specialist, which we uh, received approval to fill that position um, to uh, assist in youth and family programming and also assist in uh, facility operations, rentals, and special events, and so on. And we have one full-time custodial worker. Maple Park Community Center, we have one full-time employee, uh, a supervisor, and uh, he will be in charge of the therapeutic recreation portion of the uh, department and also the operation of Maple Park Community Center. Under him will be all the facility attendants. Spar Heights Community Center will have one supervisor. Um, this supervisor has two duties. She operates the Spar Heights Community Center and also is in charge of the Senior Meals uh, Nutritional Program and uh, the Senior Meals uh, Grant. So uh, she is uh, double duty also. Uh, the next slide will be the Customer and Event Services Unit, which includes the Civic Auditorium, the Customer Service Office, and the Citywide Special Events. We have uh, one supervisor at the Civic Auditorium, plus the event attendants and the event facilitators. We have the Customer Service 
Um, we have one supervisor supervising the customer service office, brand studios, permits and registration, and the lifelong learning classes. And she has the support of hourly employees and one full-time customer service representative. And then the supervisor also uh, is in charge of the special events and seasonal day camps. And we have one full-time specialist in charge of the specialists, um, I'm sorry, the day camps and special events. Special events include uh, Unity Fest that we just had uh, September 29th. We work with the city manager's office. Cruise night coming up in July. And um, Rose Float, which is uh, coming up December or January 1st. Um, the last slide, um, not the last slide, but maybe the last slide. Recreation programs and facilities unit. We have one manager plus uh, a supervisor. That supervisor will be supervising the sports complex, citywide sports and aquatics, and the Verdugo Skate Park. Um, under the supervisor, we have one coordinator who's in charge of the aquatics. We moved her from Pacific Pool, and she'll be in charge of the Verdugo Skate Park. Under the sports complex, we'll have one coordinator and one hourly specialist running the sports complex operations, the adult leagues, basketball league, soccer league, and softball league. And that's it. Um, it was short, sweet. Um, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, staff is uh, motivated, and we're going to provide the same level of service as we did in the last couple of years when we were fully staffed. Any Are there questions? questions? I know this is, has been an interesting time, and you guys seem to be just taking it all in stride and, and getting your act together and putting things to the, the best way you can to continue to provide the great public service that you've been providing, and I congratulate you thank on you. that and all the staff for everything that I know that they're doing now. So thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for your support and administration support, too. We have a lot of work, but uh, we're, we're getting it done. Good, good. We're getting it done, and all our employees are motivated. Supervisors are, uh, you know, taking the lead, and they're more involved in the decision-making and process and the budget process. So, uh, you know, hopefully times will change, and, you know, we'll get some of our programs back. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much for sharing with us. Okay, and I believe that that is all for today, so I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much for coming and for listening to us at home. We are adjourned. Oh, oh wait. No, no, it's okay. I'm sorry. It's done. I, I forgot. Can we, re, no, uh, no, can I unreadjourn? Because no. I forgot on. to let Steve right. talk. We're still on the air, yeah. No, I just. I think it's too late. <laughs> I think it's, I think it should be, I, I would say the same. No, I just, I wanted to thank the people up at the sports complex, the team up there, because a couple of weeks ago, my Rotary Club, along with the AYSO and Kaiser Hospitals, had a very successful blood drive up there, and we thought the Red Cross was coming in, and we were going to do it one way, and then we found out that they weren't, and uh, the staff was very helpful and very... Uh, Supportive, and we couldn't have done it without the great staff you have up there. And that's that's all I wanted okay, to you say. You had two things. Well, I won't be here next month for Thanksgiving, but you'll get over okay. It. All right. I'm I'm sorry I I didn't welcome you when you came in. No, I. But we're glad you're here, and I can now adjourn the meeting. We're now adjourned.